Good morning. I'm Steve Meyer, and uh, I get the privilege this, this morning of introducing uh, somebody I've known longer than anybody here, anybody else here, uh, John Stacknick and his wife Sharon are here. And um, we were visiting last night, and it just, uh, I uh, got to meet John in uh, 1986 as he was uh, raising, doing deputation, raising money to go uh, uh, on the mission field. And uh, his uh, approach to getting out in, in Christian service uh, from even from then has been uh, if somebody asks you to do something I think this is good for everybody if somebody asks you to do something uh, do it because there's a need right when we called him uh, uh, or I, I contacted him just a few months ago to see if he'd come up from the Twin Cities he's retired now uh, to speak uh, immediately said he, he would come and, and uh, so we appreciate that and I look forward to Hearing from John again, it's just been good to uh, spend a little time with him last night. Uh, just a little story. I mean, John continues in service, just hearing things about his life and what he's doing uh, other, for other people and stuff. But it's big and small things, Every, things that all of us can do. When we first met him, I remember uh, we had just offered, you know, you have missionaries speak in the church. The, there's an announcement can somebody house them? Uh, and we offered to. Didn't know them at all. And I was a little nervous coming home. I didn't really know them. I was late getting home. And I was thinking John and Sharon are sitting there tapping their toes. Where's this guy? Because I was still working. Come home and John's uh, laying in bed with our four kids and his child reading them a story. Something little to do. But he had, them, he had them all fascinated because it was probably a book that they're familiar with. But, and John, as he's turning the pages and the pictures are there, he's telling them a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Just making it up on the cuff. And you, that's John. Come on, John. Morning, everyone. Well, we got the Bible this morning. I'm not going to be making anything up over here, so you can relax a little bit. And uh, while well, it's a privilege to be here with Stephen and Nett, we had our family getaways uh, going back uh, many decades now. We brought our four daughters up, and sometimes I brought. One time, I brought a, a Korean student and two Chinese students, and. Uh, Steve gave us all a ride in, uh, one at a time in, the, in his dog sled, so that really kind of rocked our world, all of us. It was a first, but we had so many great times with the Myers and, and Paul and Karen Johnson here uh, at this church also, coincidentally, and uh, Paul's dad and another old farmer guy from uh, Western, Min uh, Western Wisconsin, where Paul's from, uh, were the ones that nudged me into the Evangelical Free Church and into Christian work. Back uh, beginning about 1978, there's Paul and Karen right there. So anyway, I, it, just to come here, it's, uh, I could have tears in my eyes right now. So I'm glad to be here, and, and uh, you're a lovely congregation. I'm thankful to God also. The, the, the worship team really warmed, up, warmed us up this morning in getting ready for the, for the message and the presentation. So I'll start by saying that uh, I'm still president of the International Christian Literature Distributors in Minneapolis, they've been in existence for 61 years, collecting used Bibles, used New Testaments, pastoral reference books, evangelism, children, uh, children's books, commentaries, and, and uh, Sunday school materials, etc. And you folks had four boxes in the back, and Felix, uh, young Felix, the organizer of the church, he, he had me get those out to the car before the service, and we recruited a couple men to help with that, so they're already in the vehicle. Thank you for those four cases. So... Uh, we do send books uh, all the time, free of charge, volunteer labor, and donated funds. So I'll leave um, some pamphlets and brochures. Paul put them out on the back counter over there. So if you're interested in, in that kind of a thing. So that's what we've been doing the last 14 and a half years, among other things. Now that's the main thing we're kind of doing besides kind of personal 
discipleship and a little Bible teaching once in a while and some, some, uh, some uh, hospitality, etc. So there's some pamphlets in the back there. I'd like to say about that song, too, that, uh, that send, the, send the Light. And, um, you know, I, I requested that song, actually, when Annette asked uh, if you have any prefer, preferred songs. And I forgot in, at the time I requested it, but, you know, I can't hear that song without remembering I was, uh, in, we were in Congo in, the, in mission work for a few years and uh, in some other French-speaking countries as well. But when we were in Congo, then they sent... All the missionaries were at this Bible school teaching pastors. It was kind of a lower-level Bible school. And they sent the, these pastoral candidates for two weeks upriver to go to, and they dropped, dropped them off at different villages. You know, that uh, boat that's in that old movie, The African Queen, it was kind of a boat like that. And we went upriver, the Ubangi River in northwestern Congo, and then they'd drop, they dropped me and another uh, Congolese guy off at one village, and they were dropping people off all over. So we had two weeks in these little villages, you know, no electricity, no running water, or you're out in the, really out in the boonies. And, uh, but, the, but the trip up and down the river, that was the theme song. So they were singing, not in English, but it was Kumba Pole Oyo Na Yesu. You know, so they sing, you know, Africans, they like to sing sometimes the same song for like an hour at a time. So anyway, a little sidestep on that one, but... This morning, I'd like to share my, what I think of as my original call to missions passage of the Bible. So back in the early 1980s, I went to uh, the North Central Bible College Library in Minneapolis, and I just hung out there for quite a few hours, and I was asking the Lord to give me a passage that would characterize and represent the call to missions that we felt was on our life. And then, you know, it just, after looking through different books and reading different Bible passages, this passage materialized. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's the passage in the middle of which Paul is defending his apostleship. So why should this Johnny come lately Paul be thought of as an apostle, a sent person. There were the original 12, and then Judas was the traitor, and the, uh, the remaining 11 had a vote, and they selected one more, but we never hear about him again. And then Paul emerges spectacularly on the scene in the New Testament as that new apostle. And if anyone was... If any one person besides the Lord's, Lord himself was responsible for propagating, spreading Christianity, it was the Apostle Paul. So here he is defending his, apostle Paul, uh, his apostleship. Why should he be an apostle? Why should he be that one that they should listen to? And on top of that, there were these false apostles that were out there preaching all kinds of things. And in, in heaven, maybe we'll find out what exactly they were speaking about the false ones. So, God, may you be upon us in the power of the Holy Spirit in this short time we have together to your glory, amen. And, uh, you know, I, this, this time as I present this, I'd like to just go through some of the context. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, there's, there's one word especially and another word partially that keep popping up. The word bold and the word foolish or fool. So they just keep showing up. And, you know, and as I've looked at the context of this a lot of times over the last few decades and going into chapter 12 as well, where Paul's talking about this foolishness and this boasting, foolishness and boasting. And it really shows up a lot there. But, you know, the, I, I would say and I personally that this, this um, idea of foolishness and boasting together with defending ourselves, and then this other interspersal of spiritual warfare, like that kind of famous little verse in there, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, of the, the weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal but spiritual, for the tearing down of strongholds, etc. You know, there's a, there's a lot of that in there too, but just think of all of our lives, except for the, maybe there's a few in any given group where they just had smooth sailing over the years. 
But for most of us, it was a lot of ups and downs and disappointments and struggles and hurts and sufferings and, and pain. Spiritual warfare, foolishness, and then we try to be bold or someone's trying to be bold against us. So I'm just going to go through, for the sake of context, the words that as they pop up, these words that I just commented on in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, bold. Verse 2, bold. Verse 4, weapons. Verse 5, demolish arguments and every pretensions. A little further down, verse 8, I boast. Verse 13, I boast. Verse 13 again, boasting. Verse 14, boasting. Verse 15, boasting. Verse 16, to boast. Verse 17, who boasts, boasts in the Lord. And then it goes on in the beginning of chapter 11, foolishness, jealous, jealousy. Someone comes with a different gospel. I may not be a trained speaker, but I have knowledge. I lower myself in order to elevate you. I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you, not to be a burden to anyone. He's kind of boasting there. And then a little further on in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 11, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop boasting, will stop this boasting of mine. A little further down, things they boast about. For such men are false apostles, masquerading masquerading as apostles of Christ. For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So, in all of his proclamation and all of his defense of his apostleship, he is afraid that it'll come across that he's just doing this foolish, aimless boasting. But look, Corinthians, I'm really presenting to you the true gospel, and this is why I feel that I am called of God to do so and to do so with authority. And then here where we move into chapter 11, uh, chapter 11, and then I'm going to skip right down. There's some more boasting and foolishness, etc. But th- then down we get down to verse 22. And again, he's there to boast about. I am speaking as a fool. I dare to boast about. Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. I am much more. Are they the seed of Abraham or the children of Abraham, so am I. I am much more. And I like that's the first point of this call to missions, the faith of Abraham. First he says to them, are they Hebrews? That's a cultural term or expression. They, he knows the Hebrew feast days and the celebrations and the customs and the traditions, but he's more than that. He says, are they those ones who are criticizing me and calling out against me and opposing me and the false apostles? Are they Israelites? So am I. I am much more. And he says, the Israelites, because that's, that's a national identity, like citizenship. And he knows that they're in the midst of this Roman culture in this Greek-speaking Mediterranean region, yet they're retaining and holding fast and, and, and zealous about their Israeli identity, their Israelite identity as a nationality. But then here's the key part. Are they the seed of Abraham? It might say in the King James, but in the other versions mostly it says, are they the children or the descendants of Abraham? And there is where the crux of the issue is. So are they the, what makes us a child? Are they children of Abraham? So am I. I am much more. And what makes a person a child of Abraham? And the distinction, the distinguishing mark of Abraham, of course, was his faith. Genesis chapter 15. So he takes his son Isaac up into the mountain in obedience to God by faith. He's ready to plunge the knife into his son, and the, and the son's tied up on the, on the pyre of wood and saying, Father, where's the, where's the sacrificial animal? And the father, just when he was probably with tears in his eyes, about to plunge that dagger into his son's chest. The angel of the Lord stayed his hand. He lets Isaac loose, and there's a ram in the thicket, a beautiful 
metaphorical expression in English. We have sometimes a ram in the thicket in our life. So that Abraham, he had that faith. He went all the way, and that keeps repeating itself throughout Genesis, that patriarchal era, that time when Abraham expressed a, a, a faith, a, a, a singular faith that the world has rarely seen. And then that's repeated again. So if we know our scriptures a little bit and we're wondering or new in the faith and we're wondering what does all this mean about these words we hear thrown around sometimes in theology, expiation, propitiation, justification, sanctification, glorification, righteousness, justice. We want to find out what those things mean. We go to the book of Romans. Saints, do we go to the book of Romans to find these things out? Show me some hands of some people that have spent time in Romans because they were curious about what, what we believe and why we believe it. So we go to Romans chapter 4, and we see that Genesis chapter 15, quoting verse 6 two times, where it says, God saw Abraham's faith, and he credited it to him as righteousness, and to stand right before a holy God. Imagine, we, don't, we, we, can't, we can't understand holy. We can't understand eternity. We can't understand creating out of nothing, ex nihilo. Excuse me for throwing out a Latin term, out of nothing, exit. We all know exit, ex, and nihilo, nihilism, annihilate, nothing, nothingness. Out of nothing, God created the entire world, and here he is wanting righteousness in order to stand before him, and we don't have it. Therefore, Jesus came into the world. God sent his only son to die on our behalf as a sacrifice for our sins. And that kind of righteousness, and somehow Abraham foresaw the justice and the righteous, righteousness originating from God, and he believed and he obeyed, and God saw it, and boom, he stamped on Abraham's account, paid in full, credited to him, an accounting term, credited to him as righteousness. And that Romans passage, two places in there, and the whole chapter, actually, chapter 4 of Romans, it's all about that righteousness, justice, accrediting, faith, how we also can be partakers of this eternal resting place in front of the throne of Christ through the work of Jesus. So, you know, this uh, first place, are they the seed of Abraham? And Paul, you know, uh, superficially, he might have just been talking about, you know, descendancy and the common chromosomes and genes. But really, really, from a Christian, how can we hear this without thinking of that, what was really distinctive about Abraham, namely his faith? So I would say, and I used to think, okay, this is for missionaries, for people that have a mission call on their life. And then later I thought, it's for, it's for Christian workers, anybody that wants to be involved in, in, the, in the family of God's work. And there's probably, I, I'm just going to suppose, because it's like everywhere, where there's roles in the church that are undone, you know, maybe cleaning or, or housekeeping or bookkeeping or, or whatever, groundskeeping. It could be anything in the world. But... It's more than just for the missionaries. It's more than just for the workers in the local church. It's for all of us, really. It's for all of us beginning this Christian journey with faith, the kind of faith that Abraham had and that God wants us to have, faith as little children, to step forth in obedience, loving obedience to our Heavenly Father and King. The first point on this missionary outline. Verse 23, and that uh, begins a long passage in there, and I'm going to read that to him. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in dangers 
from the, from the Gentiles in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Verses 23 through 27. 27. And you know, every time I read this, and I, I, and I forgot to look up just where it is in the Bible, but, but few of us have yet suffered unto death, striving against sin. So what do we, most of us, know about suffering? And you know, Steve read uh, at uh, Meyer, Meyer Home this morning from uh, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, a, a book, a devotional book, and it was uh, in Indonesia, the jihad of the Muslim majority against the Christian minority. But there's many, many places. You know, the, the Muslims are, and I don't want to talk again. We, Muslims, if you haven't been, if you have never made a friend with a Muslim background person, make a friend with them. You find out they're, they're, they're loving spirits and their hospitality and, and their care and concern. It's, it, they sometimes really put us to shame. And I, I say that categorically. And, you know, I'm not speaking against them, but their religion can be severe and harsh, as most of us know. So places like Yemen, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and, and look at even with Syria and Lebanon. It's unsettled after all that's gone on over there and the refugee camps. And I happen to have gone to Lebanon and, and have seen the, the I, I, think, I think 25% of the population of, of uh, Lebanon right now is Syrian refugees chased out of Syria, living in tents and shacks on the edges of these uh, desert areas and rocky places and farm fields. And I saw some of it. And, and you know, brothers and sisters, uh, there, there's many, many other places in the world, North Korea and the China and, and, and the Uyghurs in Western China we're hearing about nowadays. I never knew how to pronounce their name. It's a U-G-H-Y-U-R or something like that. You know, anyway, there's so many places in the world where where people are going through actual suffering, and a lot of it is based on the fact that they are refusing to deny Christ. They're, they're maintaining their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. They're public about it. They're in, they're, they're in openness about it, or at least they're, they're, they're not willing to deny it if somebody's banging down their door and, and confronting them. So what we go through is really nothing. But the Apostle Paul, as a way-shower, as a way shower, he look at all the what he went through. You know, being in the in the shipwrecks and in the beatings and in the stonings and in the betrayals. So he was he was uh, uh, really the ultimate missionary. And I say that to say that servanthood. So if you study the spiritual gifts in the Bible, and uh, you, you know, helps is one of them. And I, I heard some pastor kind of I don't know if he meant it as a little bit of a a joke, but he said uh, he, he said that helps is probably the most frequently given gift to the body of Christ because we need so much help because of how foolish and how weak we are, and so helps shows up a lot. People want to help out, and you know even non Christians, you know we're not we don't have an, we don't have a you know a, a exclusivity on that, but helping out or giving back we say nowadays we want to give back we want to help out. Servanthood, that's got to be a sign. Even if it's not your strongest gift, even if it's not your, your ultimate gift. And I heard a, another pastor or Bible teacher say that whatever, you find out what your main gift is and your secondary gift is, but then practice all the gifts. And I would probably add to that, practice helps. Always be ready to help out. Servanthood. Identity in Christ as by faith, and servanthood. And then these last two verses that always touch me, verses 28 and 29. Besides all these things, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. I burn inside with passion. If I see my brother, my sister, they're falling, they're struggling, they're sinning, 
I have a pain inside because of that. I'm not, I'm not easy. I can't just forget about it, go home, watch a, fo- a football game, or, or do some, 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 something irrelevant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in anguish, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's some prayer warriors, as they, they used to say. There's probably, I'm sure there's some prayer warriors in this church. When you find out about some family, maybe your own family, maybe some other family, where that brother, that sister, that son, that daughter, that grandchild, they're falling into sin. They're going down some crooked path or some wide path, like the Bible says, instead of following that straight and narrow door, then we're, we're on our knees. And it doesn't hurt to get down on our knees and actually show God some genuflection once in a while. So we got to feel when the others are feeling. I remember when I was, uh, I was in the Black Pentecostal church for a little while, and there was, uh, I would going to do pickups with Brother Tony in the beat-up old Plymouth van the church used to have. And, uh, and Tony was there. He was 10 years younger than I am, but he was preaching at me pretty hard. And uh, he said, Brother John, we just when, when somebody's out there hurting, when I'm hurting, you got to come in alongside of me. You know, that, well, then he was absolutely right. And I was, I think, Brother Tony on this passage. So besides all these things, I face daily. So here's the Apostle Paul. He's, he's been around planning these churches. He's gone back and, and visited them. He sent people to them. He writes them letters, and he's in, in the midst of sufferings. He's in the midst of hardships. He's in the midst of turmoils. And yet, besides all these things, he faces daily in his private mind, in his quietness, he's facing daily the pressure of his concern for all these churches. And this is in the book of Corinthians, which is notorious for the kind of nasty little things that were happening among the, the congregants, you know, the, the attenders of that church congregation. And he's facing daily the pressure of his concern for all these churches that he's been involved with, that he's loved, that he's planted, that he's prayed for. Who is weak in that church? And he's remembering brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Who is weak in that church? Who is led into sin in that local church? And I'm not feeling it. I'm not empathizing with that person. Love for the local church. So we got the faith of Abraham. We have the servanthood that Paul describes that he went through. And here in these last two verses of this passage, the love for the local church. And guess what, everybody? You know, and I, I've had a wrestle with this. After my, I, I say I, I was raised Catholic, then I have 14 years in the wilderness, like I told the prayer group this morning, and then I came to faith in Christ in that black Pentecostal church. And among those things I wrestled with, I'm going to tell you, though, I won't take a long time, but I'll say the things I wrestled with was, was this really the inspired word of God? Did God somehow from some invisible place in the atmosphere or the universe or heaven or wherever somehow transcend eternity and somehow inspire people to produce this book that was that was a big wrestling match i accepted as the word of god the whole bible i also wrestled with similarly did god himself come into this world, somehow become flesh, grew up sinlessly, and died, and was buried, and rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now we're waiting for him to come back? God the Son, Jesus? That was another wrestling match. And I don't know, I don't ever said it this way, but I might as well say it this way. I probably say that the third wrestling match I've had, even though I would say it's the best thing I think in existence in this world, I'll back that off a little bit. God instituted two things in this world, for sure, marriage and the church. So let's say I love my wife. We've been married 41 years. 41, right, darling? Okay, 41. And and, us. Let's, let's just leave that one. So the other wrestling match I had was over the church. But I, all the time, in, in, including right now, I think it's the best thing out there for the human race. 
in the church is where we, we see, if we come regularly, not this business about I, I go to church when I go out in the woods or when I'm sitting in my, in my uh, rowboat fishing or something or whatever, all of that kind of stuff. Just let's talk about actual church attendance. So when we're at church regularly, not just television, but when we're at church regularly where people could see our weaknesses, the way we interact, the way we talk to each other, our body language, the looks on our faces, hi, how are you? But I, actually, I, I want to get out of here. You know, all of that kind of, all those things that are happening besides our dramas and our, our sufferings in our family lives that people, even if we don't talk about it, somehow they find out about it and, and how our kids turn out and, all, and how we deal with it. When we have a, a child that's gone astray, and I, I could ask for a show of hands on that one too, and, and, uh, and we, have, we have one, so, you know, it's in a group home right now. And, you know, but all of these things, how we deal with these things, that's the only place feasible. It's the only logical, it's the only healthy place to grow as individuals, to grow as Christians and to work out our blemishes, our stains, and our wrinkles. The church is great for that, and I really keep reminding myself that the church is really the only, the only uh, Petri dish, the only, the only, uh, only laboratory, the only, the only nursery for morals, ethics, and values. And if anybody's going to have a positive impact on society, no matter how society how much it's broken, how bad the politics are, how much polarization and hatred's out there. If anybody's going to have an impact on it, it's got to be the church. And on top of all of that, even if that was just human reasoning that I was presenting right now, on top of that, it's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. You know, we look at these in Corinthians also. It's the bride of Christ. It's the body of Christ. In Corinthians, we see a lot of that, and in Revelation. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. And I'm real careful how I say anything about the church. And I hope I didn't say anything negative, because there are flaws. There are blemishes, and people don't want to come to church. I don't like so-and-so. I, I don't like the gossip. I don't like the cliques. I don't like the cliches. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm not going to church. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going anyway. I'm going anyway. It's the only place that's got any... Hope. I don't trust any of these other institutions and, and human reasonings and philosophies and organizations. You know, I was a Boy Scout. I like the Boy Scouts. And, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But this is God's plan, the church, his body. It's God's plan, the church, his bride. Third point on this missionary outline or the outline for all of us, love for the local church. So if you got to hang up, Brothers and sisters, friends, you got to hang up about the local church. You don't want to participate because of this and that or whatever. Please get over it. That's all I could say. You know, faith, faith of Abraham, servanthood, the service of Paul as an example, and, and many others we've met along the way, and love for the local church. That, that's the story for this morning, everyone. And it's really a privilege to be here. My wife and I were going to come up. We're going to sing, uh, going to sing a little, some verses we used to sing with our kids. We, I wish we could. We taught our kids the languages, uh, but they said we're in America. Talk English to us. So anyway, but we're going to sing a little bit from our, from our uh, background with Christian work.